We live in a time of global transformation. The Energy Futures podcast explores how we can accelerate the expansion of clean energy technologies and reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. From heating and cooling our homes to moving around our planet and beyond, we bring together researchers, scientists, business leaders and communicators to exchange knowledge and try to answer one important question. How can we create a sustainable energy future for all? This podcast is produced by Energy Futures Lab of Imperial College London. In today's episode, we're joined by Dr. Sam Cooper, reader in AI for materials design at Imperial College London and co-founder of Polaron. We'll discuss the pivotal role of batteries in the energy transition, explore cutting-edge innovations in material design, and uncover how Polaron is addressing global material needs. The first thing actually I wanted to ask you was about the name Polaron, because I love the name. Okay. And I'd like to know kind of where the, the name came from. Right, well, it's a science word. Uh, and so it's this idea of if you've got a kind of little distortion in a crystal lattice, uh, actually all of the things around it get a bit distorted as well. And you can simulate that as if it were its own particle. And that has nothing to do with what our company does at all. We went through lots of possible names uh, I think like iron craft and other things like that. And eventually we decided that Polaron sounded very grown up and businessy, which I think it is. Um, and also is true to our sort of material science roots uh, and so aligned very well. Yeah, from a design point of view, it looks nice and it rolls right. off the tongue quite nicely as exactly. well. Exactly, yeah. The statement on your website says, world leaders at the interface between AI and materials. Expand on that for me. <laughs> so, uh, Material science is obviously a very well-established discipline and has been making a big impact for a century or more. And AI is comparatively recent. And so it's a bit nerve-wracking thinking about where you are in the sort of standing of either of these two disciplines. But what I think we've found with the work of my group and our collaborators at Imperial is that there aren't that many people at the interface of AI and material science. And so when we go to conferences and, uh, or speak with industry, we find a really huge appetite for the kind of work we're doing. And we've increasingly found that the kind of tools that we've released and the capabilities that we have are at the cutting edge of what's possible right now at the interface of AI and material science. So although it's a bit nerve wracking, I think that's a fair, <laughs> fair statement about where we are at Polaron. And, and did that organically come from your research? Did it, was, was it an organic idea? Was it a, a, a eureka moment? Or was it, where was, when was it like, this needs to be commercialized? That's a really good question. So th there's been a, a ramp. And so I started my group about seven years ago and I've been incredibly blessed with really talented students, uh, which is one of the privileges of being at Imperial that very good people come here. Uh, and we were looking for applications of the most cutting edge bits of AI into material science. We thought this stuff is very powerful at making pictures of kittens and hot air balloons. It must be able to do something impactful as well. And so we tapped into this idea of microstructure, which was something related to my PhD. So the microstructure of many electrochemical devices, how they are at the smallest scale, is really important for how they behave as a device. And we found that you could use some of these AI techniques to, to capture, to model, to represent microstructure, and then help us understand how it works and why it's important. And so we had a few papers come out that were about modeling these distributions, some papers that had really clever tricks that people hadn't seen before, like taking a 2D image and turning it into a 3D volume, just with AI, without you telling it what's probably going on, and then the step after that, we managed to do something which was mapping processing parameters to microstructure, which is to say, if you have a factory that makes a material with microstructure, all of the processes in your factory, the pressure, the temperature, the speed, the drying rates, all of these things, will actually have an impact on the microstructure that comes out the other side. And so how do you go about tuning all of the knobs and dials in your factory to get the microstructure that you want for the performance that you want? Very, very difficult. And actually, the state of the art for simulating that kind of thing with a physics-based simulation is 
tends to be sort of dropping imaginary spheres in a box and hoping that they come out with the right distribution. It looks nothing like the real thing. And so we found a way that uses generative AI to map pairs of these things. So your factory sets all the parameters in your machines, microstructure comes out, take a picture. Set them differently, take a picture. Set them differently, take a picture. We feed all that to the algorithm and it just learns the relationship between all of the settings in your factory and the microstructure that comes out of it. And that is a bit of a game changer mm -hmm. uh, because it also is thousands of times faster than doing it with a physics-based simulation, which means you can start to do something called optimization. Right now, you can build it into a mathematical framework where you can say, right, my customers come to me, they want this type of battery, for example. We know that that type of battery needs this type of microstructure. How do we make it? And previously, it would have been go to some guy who's been doing it for 30 years and has some spreadsheet, and he goes and tweaks the knobs a bit. Now, we put it into our algorithm and it finds you these settings and says, this is the one, make that. And it's accurate. It's really accurate. Yeah. Okay. That being said, one of the interesting things about academia is that we don't get to do things at the scale of industry. So I can come to you and say it's accurate in a lab. Mm. And so that was also another motivation for spinning Polar Run out of Imperial, that we wanted to do it for real. And so there's only so much impact that you can have on the academic side. Eventually, you have to take your ideas to industry and try them for real. And it's, you know, it's so messy and complex by comparison and so out of control often. And so this next stage is about taking these things that have worked at the sort of lab scale to a big, you know, dirty factory and saying, can it work here as well? And that's what we're going to find out in the next couple of years. Amazing. So you mentioned batteries and we've talked about industry. Give me some examples or case studies where this type of technology will be used in, within industry. What type of organisations are you looking at? So batteries is a great case study and we'll probably talk more about those later. But anything where your microstructure is important. So that can be alloys, it can be solar cells, it can be any kind of like advanced composites or ceramics really a very wide range of things, even in things like uh, concrete, cement. So if you care about the relationship between the properties at the micro scale and how those impact the macro scale, then our tool might be right for you. Speaking of concrete, um, obviously we're, we're, we're recording this in July 2024. Um, I'm sure there's a company that could have, been, could have used your AI um, technology creating concrete not that long ago with the, uh, the recall of the, the schools that were the... Oh, uh, God. Well, <laughs> that's probably too spicy a topic for me to touch on. <laughs> Optimization in general needs to be there. I think one of the things that Imperial has been good at recently is about, or, and actually the Dyson School where we are today, design engineering, is about holistic thinking. So it's not good enough anymore just to design the strongest material if that means it's going to have terrible environmental impacts and tear the planet apart and all these things, right? So you need to incorporate the broader impact of your design into the process throughout. I think that's another thing that our approach fits really well with, which is that you need to optimize not just for cost, which I think was the case in that example, but also for safety and sustainability. And so all these things need to be brought into the optimization loop. The trouble is that often if your principal driving force is political or financial, then those other things might not be factored in, even if they were possible. I'm sure there were possible solutions mm. that were safe, but uh, perhaps weren't seen as important. But I think we're seeing more and more pressure on industry talking of environmental impact. So this kind of leads perfectly into sustainability because that's obviously going to be a huge area for you in terms of making materials more sustainable. And again, it leads back to batteries. So let's kind of touch now on in terms of looking at materials for sustainability. Can you give any examples of where you know, industry are looking at this type of process? Yeah, so perhaps a nice one could be composite materials. So, so uh, materials that combine two different materials together and they're trying to get synergistically the best of both. So a really good example could be uh, wind turbine blades where you're trying to get the strength of some fibers like a carbon fiber material incredibly strong uh, and then the kind of adhesion capabilities of some kind of resin like epoxy resin that people might be familiar with. But when you mix these two things together exactly how should you mix them together and exactly what arrangement of these things should you have and if you can get them to be lighter and stronger, then your wind turbines are cheaper and they generate more power. And so it's another like really nice example of where microstructure 
things all the way down sub-millimeter scale have impacts on the scale of 100 meter across wingspan of a, of a turbine. So yeah, like that kind of thing. And can that be applied to durability in, as, as well in terms of how long? Because obviously we're building lots and lots of turbines at the moment and they need to last a long time. Otherwise they're not as sustainable as they appear. So yeah. does, the, does Polar One look into how long things can last as well? So it, it's a kind of very, agnostic optimization framework. So in the end, we would need to have someone's durability model, which these industries tend to have models of their own that describe the properties of the materials. They just don't know how to make the one that they want often because it's very tricky. And so what we would do is be a sort of glue that integrates all these different aspects together and then allows you to design a thing that has considered sustainability, durability, cost, as well as the micro scale mechanical properties as well. Okay, brilliant. So um, I always like to kind of look at the challenges first and then we move on to solutions. Yeah, but yeah. Let's, let's kind of let's look at sort of the energy as a whole, uh, energy transition. But where do you see the biggest challenges are in terms of materials, in terms of reaching zero carbon by 2050? Gosh, OK. So start with the, any, anyone that you want yeah. to start with. I mean, at the biggest scale, it's not yet clear how you store energy on the scale of months, right? And I think it's very interesting. There are publicly available documents, things like Tesla Master Plan, which, which I would recommend people to read. It's, actually, it's a really short and digestible document uh, that gives you a sense of the scale of the challenge. And one of the interesting things about that document is that despite uh, being very dismissive about hydrogen as a storage technology for things like a car. You know, I don't think there'll ever be hydrogen cars on a massive scale, for example. But we might ultimately have to do something crazy like pump hydrogen into caverns so that we can store vast amounts of energy across seasons. And that is something we don't fully understand how to do yet. You know? And so there's some really interesting things that feel almost paradoxical, which is that we can really rule out hydrogen in the short and medium term for lots of things like, you know, like cars. But in the longer term, it looks like some of these things will have to happen and we don't know how to do it. Um, and so I think that's very troubling. Uh, what's incredibly promising is that the price of wind and particularly solar is continuing to plummet. And that's wonderful. And, and you know, you've got innovations at places like Imperial and other great institutions around the world where these materials, we keep discovering new and interesting solar materials. And now, the, because the systemic thinking is there, it's not just about the best efficiency for converting photons into electricity. It's also about, can you source the materials at a huge scale required? And can you be sure that they're not going to degrade and poison us when they, when they eventually expire? So I think this kind of thinking is increasingly prevalent, and it's promising for us in terms of what we'll be able to do at the scale required. And solar is ultimately, in my view, going to be the middle term winner. And I don't think that's a very controversial view at this point. It's just unbelievably cheap to generate solar energy, which is wonderful. Amazing. And I, I hear actually storage and distribution come up again, yeah. again, over. And I suppose we can go back to storage now and look, well, let's go into batteries because yeah. we're obviously going to <laughs> talk a lot about batteries because it's, it, it's such a key part of the transition, um, mm. storing energy and distributing energy. And like you said, the technology needs to speed up. How does your research play a role in this? What kind of what, what work are you working on? What are you working on currently that's contributing to the to helping fix this problem? Right. So my group, as I've mentioned, is about generating tools that link together the most amazing stuff happening in AI to material science. And the tools that we've developed generally allow you to understand what's going on better as it's the kind of core of the sciences. So I've mentioned about this idea of the micro scale being very important. And so maybe I can give you like a short sketch about how batteries work. If that Go for it, yeah, no, so, yeah, definitely. So apologies to anyone who already understands this, but I think there's a lot of misunderstanding out there about batteries in general. And so you've got two sides, two electrodes, and they're both kind of spongy, porous materials in the conventional cell that is in most cars today. And these are made of particular materials. One side's made of graphite, and one side's made of like a metal oxide material. Could be nickel, metal, nickel, manganese, cobalt, these kind of things. And the core of it is thermodynamics, which is a term that will put many people off. 
But actually, thermodynamics can be thought of as preferences, okay? this anthropomorphization of what's going on. And the reality is lithium, this, this little metal, very light metal, would prefer to be in one of them than the other one. And actually inside the crystal, not just in the pores, inside the crystal of the solid. So lithium would rather be inside the metal oxide of the cathode than it would be inside the graphite layers. Okay? And so if you have forced it into the graphite layers, if you allow it to travel into the metal oxide, it will give you usable work, which we would take as electricity. Okay? In all the pores and in the gap between these two sides and in all the pores of both sides is a liquid, a special liquid that's got lithium dissolved in it. And so that's how it can hop out of one solid, migrate through to the other side and hop into the other side. And when you allow it to do that by connecting a wire to both sides, then you get useful work coming out of the side. And so that's the core of a battery. And as you can imagine, these porous electrodes, all the details inside them, will influence how far your car can drive and how quickly you can charge it up. So we'd love to have you know, these batteries that charge instantly and let you drive all the way to Scotland. But part of the problem is that the lithiums have to travel quite a long way if you've got big, thick electrodes. So we have to make them thinner, and then your car can't drive as fast. And so it's a, it's, it's a complicated optimization problem. And, and is that a scalability issue? Do we have the technology, but not the materials, or vice versa? What, what's the biggest issue we have here? I think the biggest issue is about our perception of what we need, right? And so I think we've been convinced that it's important to have a car that can drive you know, 300 miles when we almost never drive more than 50. I think, yeah, the biggest problem is about sort of the human mindset. But from a technological perspective, yeah, there are some critical mineral challenges. So the most popular materials are now for the cathode side often contain cobalt. And cobalt is mostly from the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's mostly mined by in terrible conditions um, and people living in sort of indentured servitude essentially to, to extract this mineral from the ground. Awful. And this will be in the minerals, in the device, in your pocket that you call people with. Really terrible to think of. And I think it's one of those things where our grandchildren will look back and say, what were you thinking? That's awful. Uh, but that is, I guess, the nature of <laughs> technological society. So we do have some critical mineral challenges, but I would say it's really important to stress that the main challenge is the way that we live our lifestyles and not really the technology. The technology is fantastic. And already this material is less popular in China, for example, where they've used a iron-based cathode instead for the most part, and it's cheaper and it's safer and it's more sustainable and it's iron, so it's extremely abundant. And you can drive a bit less far than with the cobalt systems. But we don't need to drive that far most of the time. So mm. I think, yeah, that there are the technological solutions are there in terms of you know, iron phosphate batteries and, and, and um, uh, solar panels and wind turbines. It's about how we uh, adopt them and use them as mm. the real challenge. I think we've probably got another podcast episode there talking about cars and consumption and, and yeah. where EVs going and, and or just how we move around, how we yeah. travel, how we have a, how many cars we have, do we have a car? So, Absolutely, yeah. I mean, yeah. there's so much discussion about cars, but as you say, the sustainable option will be to take a bus or take your bicycle. Um, and I think you know any notion that you are helping by buying a an SUV with a you know 200 kilowatt hour battery is, I think, a kind of madness. Yeah. Mm. And, and how much performance you can get out of the car as well. We're talking about how, you know, electric cars and electrifying cars, but performance is a, is a key issue. And that moves back to batteries. Uh, what I'd kind of like to touch on now is where batteries are used. I think a lot of people will know, listening to this, that we, we're moving towards electri electrification of cars and that has batteries. But where else are batteries now being used? Uh, in terms of the, the, the full landscape. Right. So the, the next one that I think is worth mentioning in this context is about grid scale storage. So basically you get a load of batteries, you put them in a shipping container. Often you don't even take them out. You leave them in this thing and you deploy it somewhere and connect it to the grid. And it's able to store quite a big chunk of energy, absolutely peanuts compared to the scale of the whole grid, but you can do really useful things with it. And so, to understand how, you have to realize that not every joule of energy is gonna be worth the same amount of money. And the reason is sometimes you need more really quickly and, and sometimes you don't. And so what you can do with these uh, 
big sort of containerized batteries is you can provide power to the grid at just an important moment where it needs it. And so, for example, if the wind suddenly stops blowing and the wind turbines go dead, you might need a bit of energy for the next half an hour. And these big containers can, can offer that. The alternative would be either having the power go down, which we don't want to have, or turning a gas power plant on and having it off the rest of the time. And so it's been really a huge success in the UK and other places to add grid storage in the form of batteries. It's been really impressive. And where does that sit in the, the transition? Because obviously there's, there's different points now until we're fully powered by renewables and we have enough, we have a, a grid that could support that power 24 hours a day. How are these batteries going to be used along the, the sort of the next couple of decades? Um, increasingly. I mean, I, to, I, you know, short of giving you like a very detailed deployment perspective, like they are going to be very, very important indeed. And part of the reason that they're going to be important, to be important is that their price has been plummeting in, a, in a, an absolutely astonishing way. And I think one of the things that, particularly in the West, we've been quite blind to, certainly in my education, is just how exciting and important it is to understand how to make things. And I guess, you know, the UK has sort of a you know, dying industry for many years during my childhood. And so, you don't really get to see, you get to see the really cool science bit where people invent stuff, but to turn that into a product and make a billion of them is the bit that's quite alien to us. We kind of associate that with East Asia because that's mostly where it's done. And it's actually incredibly cool to make stuff, incredibly interesting. And that's you know, more exciting than designing a solar panel is designing a factory that builds solar panels, incredibly complicated thing to do. And so I think, yeah, it's gonna be really exciting to see a kind of new perspective about how you make a systemic change, which is based around the manufacture of things and not just about coming up with cool new ideas. Because um, we often talk about A to B, you know, this is where we need to be by 2050, this is where we are now. And yeah. actually, I know that there is a, it's not completely clear what's around the, next, what's around the next year or the next 10 years, yeah. but I think it's, it's good for our listeners to know where are we going where and I, I like the fact that you you mentioned the word exciting because it is exciting Huge. because we can look at the this the, where we are in terms of climate change and where we are in terms of pollution and you know working with old using fossil fuels it's very negative and and I yeah. suppose it, it's really quite hard for people to understand where we're going but I think you bring a lot of excitement to this and I, I'd like to kind of know more about you now okay. Sam I'd like to know where this energy and creativity comes from and you've mentioned a few different things about you know, where you, you that you study and um, that you've taught you teach here at imperial you set your business up here but let's go back down memory lane where did it all start <laughs> uh gosh i wasn't expecting this bit okay uh well my my parents are both doctors so they're both science people and they're both instilled in me a huge interest in science i can still remember my dad explaining nuclear power, how the core of it worked to me as we were driving to a friend's house and thinking, I want to get involved in that. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, but possibly even more important was my grandma, uh, who, she was a social scientist and social worker, but she was just the most kind of enthusiastic, interested, kind person you could ever hope to meet. And she was a university lecturer as well. And so just the way that she would engage with things with a kind of positivity all the time and, a, and an interest and a creativity, I think captured me and, and yeah. I remember I went to her when I was about 18 and said I was thinking of studying uh, physics and philosophy at university. And she said, perhaps you should consider doing something useful. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and she was joking, but she was also serious. And, and so in the end, I actually decided to study engineering, which is why I came here. Uh, and she said, you can, you, know, you can do physics and philosophy when you're my age, when you're retired. You can save those up as hobbies. But if you don't learn to be useful now, you probably never will. So you should get on with that. So, I, so that's what I did. I came to learn to be useful. And I studied mechanical engineering here at Imperial. It's a very challenging degree. Uh, and then went on to do a material science PhD. And, and having that increasing exposure to other people who are really interested in the details, I think that's what's got me excited. And then particularly during my PhD, starting this process of becoming a tool maker, which is that I noticed that there were other people in the research group that had consistent problems. So they were collecting this 
kind of data from a very uh, elaborate machine called a secondary iron mass spectrometer time of flight detector. And they wanted to analyze it. And they were all analyzing it a bit differently. And they all had their own Excel spreadsheet or bit of code or whatever. And there was no standardization. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to build a kind of graphical user interface on, on the top of a bit of code that analyzed this data for everyone in a consistent way and reported the results? And so I built that as a sort of side project for my PhD, which ultimately became kind of half of my whole thesis about how do you do this in a really systematic way. And that's now what my group does. They build scientific tools to enable the community to do things faster and more consistently and hopefully more excitingly. Amazing. And is there any kind of projects over the last few years that have really uh, grabbed your attention and uh, imagination and any other types of apps or software or engineering that's gone, you know, that's really doing some impactful work? From my team or from the rest of the world? From your team would be great to know. From my team. I mean, all of it. I think if you spoke to them, they would tell you with a smile that I get pretty obsessed with everything that we're doing. Um, but one of the really nice bits that sticks with me that's also a kind of nice story, I've mentioned this 2D to 3D thing, which is very cool. But another one is about data fusion. So imagine you've got two different techniques for analyzing your material, and they've both got their own strengths and weaknesses. Perhaps one is sort of very high resolution and can see all the different materials, but it's only two dimensional and it's a small region. And you've got another technique that's perhaps a nice big field of view, 3D, but it's missing some of the information, it's a bit coarse. Wouldn't it be great if you can combine those two together? And so we developed this generative AI-based data fusion model that could just stitch together any, not any, but many types of data to allow you to get the both world, best of both worlds from many of your characterization techniques. And there are so many complementary characterization techniques in material science where currently you do one of each, you put them in different bits of your paper and you say, well, I think this one is implying this about this, but it's really hard. With the model that we've got, we can say, right, well, let's just stitch all that together. And now we can go and test hypotheses about our material by running simulations that has all the information it needs at every point in space. That, that's one of the ones that I've, yeah, really enjoyed a lot. It's an exciting time, isn't it? The, the fact that engineering and the, the speed and acceleration where materials and development is going in terms of the technology, but then looking at these new technologies like machine learning and um, AI and combining this to create really innovative new products and, and software and, and apps, etc. Yeah. Um, and I suppose that's kind of really how Polaron was started by just combining these elements of Very much tech. so. Absolutely. And I think another core part of the company is seeing that there are lots of you know, fantastic material science companies out there developing devices or, or, or new synthesis routes or whatever, uh, but they would like to do some machine learning. They would really like to do some machine learning, but they don't necessarily know exactly what. And part of what we can do is come to them and say, you know, tell us your problems and we can try and integrate it into our platform. Here's our sort of core offering of you know, state-of-the-art AI that we've developed. But in addition, if you can articulate what it is that you want to do, we'll be able to find a way to weave that into what we're doing such that you can solve your problems. And that's, that's incredibly exciting because you hear directly from the factory that's making the you know, concrete, steel, you know, turbine blade or whatever, we need to be able to translate from this to this. Can you do it? Yeah, I think we can. Amazing. I've got two things in my mind that I want to ask you, and I'm trying to think which one to go first. I was thinking about sustainability. I've often said that sustainability starts at home. Mm. People get really interested in conservation, in nature, in, ter uh, in terms of being more, living a more sustainable lifestyle. But where yeah. do the sustainability side of things come in? Is that something that's always been in your life, or is it something that's coming later on? Do my mum has always been a green, um, proudly so, before it was cool, I'd say. <laughs> Uh, and so I, I'm from the countryside. I grew up in the middle of rural Norfolk and I resented it quite a lot as a kid because there was nothing to do and nowhere to go. Uh, but as an adult going back to the countryside and you know going on holiday to magical places like the west coast of Scotland, it reinforces this idea of tragedy about the devastating impacts that our sort of luxury lifestyles have on the rest of the world. So yeah, I guess it was something that I was aware of as a kid and it became increasingly obvious that it was not just in very important morally, but also a real tragedy to see species lost and habitat destruction and, and all the human suffering that's involved. So I think it's, 
I think also to the generation below me, it's unbelievably obvious, sort of screamingly obvious. And it's hard, I think, for them to hear from people my age and above that they aren't urgent about it, that somehow we've managed to see that there's a disaster, but I think you just sort of potter along. Having that as a foundational value or guiding principle that, you know, it's about this idea of protection, restoration, regeneration. Yeah. I find when there are core principles for anyone that's working in this space, it tends to have create a stronger, stronger principles in the work and also can guide you back to help with decision making. Why are we doing this? Who is it for? Yeah. Who are we trying to protect? And I think it creates more ethical decisions. Yeah, yeah, I think that's something that's very represented here in the Dyson School, these ideas of co-design, making sure that all of the stakeholders are involved in the process. And that, of course, is in practice often really difficult and not so much difficult from the practicalities which can be overcome, but difficult because of a lack of political will that you know, big companies who are extracting fossil fuels or making you know, a billion tons of steel don't necessarily want to have the people who are going to suffer as a consequence to be part of the decision-making team. But I think this kind of thing is coming because it will have to come because the pressure will mount. Uh, so it's an exciting time for change, I think, there as well in terms of the political perspective because people are aware that there's such big problems coming for us. And I like the, the fact that when you talk about design thinking that ultimately you, you're thinking about not just the end user, the, the people, society that are using these materials yeah. in their day-to-day -day life, but also beyond that in terms of the bigger ecosphere and thinking about the impact on nature, the, thing, the impact on wildlife and wild spaces. And that extra, those extra layers into creating products is changing everything in the way that we produce things. And I suppose trying to kind of anchor that back to Polaron, yeah. how are you thinking beyond industry in terms of material and material design? How, how are you thinking about the end user and the, the natural world? How do they play a part in the decision-making process? So it's tricky to articulate because in a way we we're a small piece of the puzzle, right? So we are a kind of materials characterization and optimization framework. And what we do is enabling you to build in these things, things like sustainability perspectives into your workflow. I guess ultimately we can't force you to, <laughs> uh, but then that comes down to an interesting, nice feature of being part of a, a startup with people that you, with whom you morally very align, highly align. So uh, my two co-founders, Isaac and Steve, both PhD graduates from my group at Imperial, are fabulous people and are hugely ethically motivated to deliver a product that will benefit the world. And I think if a customer came to us and said, can you design us a steel that would impact the planet in a terrible way? I think we would say that's probably not the project that we'd like to pursue. Um, but there are, you know, there are really complicated questions to answer because in the end, building more products ultimately might just be fueling a more consumerist world and that's ultimately doing the harm. Even if that product is a little bit more sustainable than the last one, you might well be doing more harm than good. And the trouble is those calculations are very difficult to make. And so what do you do as a small startup? Do you get paralyzed by indecision about what you should do next? Or do you follow your intuition about what you think would be impactful and positive? Really hard questions, I think, yeah. for, every, for every company in the tech space. Totally, because it's, it's impossible to almost have these conversations and make, this, make these decisions without incorporating ethics, morals, and values. Right. And yeah. as soon as you bring that into the mix, you do, you just become, you, you, you freeze from the decision-making process yeah. because ultimately, we talk about consumerism and building things and making things. Yep. They call them wicked problems for a reason. Absolutely. There's, a, there's a great book called Doing Good Better by a guy who's become famous in the last few years, Will McCaskill. He's a philosophy professor at Oxford. And he's kind of one of the pioneers of the effective altruist movements, right? So it's this idea that not all, you know, units of charitable work will result in the same amount of good being done in the world. Um, and they've come under a lot of scrutiny recently because of the catastrophe with Sam Bankman Freed and the, you know, the disaster around these various things. But the core tenets of this about you know, rationally analyzing how you do your charity is absolutely sound and I fully subscribe to it. 
However, his follow-up book about how do you think about the hypothetical trillions of future humans who might get born and how do you factor those into just becomes an absolute minefield of, you know, philosophical navel-gazing, I suppose, to mix my metaphors. But it, it, it comes, to the, it's, the, it's sort of the biggest scale of the same problem, which is in the end, if you want to decide which thing to do, A or B, how far into the future do you need to gaze and what's your appetite for uncertainty as you're doing that? It's just incredibly tricky. And I think it comes back to a kind of data-informed, rational, common sense, where you have to say at some point, I can't do nothing, so I should probably make a decision and I'm going to do it with the best evidence available and the best analysis I can do, but I should do something. And, and it kind of fix, looking at what do we need to do right now, yeah. what do we need to do moving forward and what do we need to do in the future? And it's kind of that curve of, you know, what, how do we create sustainable practices right now, sustainable yeah. materials, a sustainable infrastructure with the with the kind of idea moving forward that it will have regenerative practices, regenerative design, fix and restoration is obviously going to be something that's going to be important moving forward. Yeah. Um, but trying to incorporate that into the decision making process, yeah. into the design thinking. Absolutely. Is... So, so another really thorny example is that, of course, none of the early batteries, none of the batteries up until, you know, relatively recently were in a sense sustainable, right, because they cost a huge amount of energy to make and used a huge amount of very particular materials. But buying them put money into an industry which has now been able to produce batteries that will be sustainable. So at what point did it become okay to fund the initial batteries? You know, your original Tesla Roadster, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, that wasn't a sustainable car. But it might be that the next generation of car after this one is, and you had to put the money in at some point to get to that place. So it's just very, very hard to know what the right thing to do at any given moment. Often it's more clear what wrong things are. <laughs> you can really point your finger at some things that are abundantly wrong, but uh, it still doesn't make it easy for a small company like Polaroid to think, which customer should we take on next? Uh, and, th and that kind of leads perfectly into the, to the next segue of this conversation, which is um, the future. You know, where, where, so kind of seeing where we've been and where we are now and where we're going and we, we you know there is a there is a rough plan moving forward with the new government about where we're going to how we're going to reach zero carbon how we're going to produce a, a better grid how we're going to produce cleaner energy how do you see polar on um, fit, fitting into this narrative well i think it's been really exciting to see just how many uh tech startups around both ai and batteries have been bubbling up in the UK. And I think that's because the UK, you know, has got a hugely oversized kind of higher education and research uh, core for considering the size of the country. It's, you know, we really do very well in that space. And I think one of the things for everyone to remember is that, of course, politics doesn't stop once you've voted for a government at the election. And it's about people maintaining consistent amounts of huge pressure on this Labour government to do all the green stuff that they've sort of been talking about hesitantly throughout the election campaign. So I think it's a very promising moment, and I think lots of tech startups like, like Podron, like Breathe Batteries and About Energy, two other battery startups from Imperial, really good stuff that they're doing, to sort of seize this moment and have an impact by making massive partnerships with major manufacturers around the world. One of the things that's been very sad for the UK was to see British Vault, which was our sort of original uh, gigafactory pitch, uh, not make it into being a fully functioning gigafactory and, and falling apart in the end. But it would be great to see the UK have gigafactories. And this is happening. This is all going to happen. I won't talk about it in too much detail, but it's a really exciting time to be in the UK in that regard. And I think companies like Polar On and Breathe and About will have a role in making sure that the best sales, the best tech, the best AI is put into place where it's needed. Amazing. Um, we've got audiences and listeners listening to this or watching this that may not work in industry, might not work in policy or academia, but they just have an interest in living a more sustainable life, trying to do the right thing, make the right decisions. From an energy and battery perspective, mm -hmm. what should people be doing or thinking about at least to try and be more sustainable at home, be more, um, be more effective in the way that they're using energy? What would, what would you suggest? It, it's a good question. 
uh, and it's a very um, loaded area because I think there were deliberate attempts by various you know, oil companies to try and push the responsibility onto the individual about how much impact they have. But of course, systemic change is what's required. And so it's not about, oh, or it's not so much about whether you remember to recycle your carbon, cardboard and your carbon, um, and, and more about pressuring your government at every level to do major economic reform and major industrial reform to get the changes we need. The personal things you should do, of course, everyone knows, is to fly less and eat less meat. Those are sort of the two big things that you can really do. Um, and I think this idea that's very interesting about people getting fatigue, where, and I don't know the evidence behind this, I'm not a social scientist, but you can spend so much time faffing around with your cardboard recycling that you've run out of energy to think about the bigger picture and what you really need to do. And that is, I think, you know, it's part of my experience that you can feel distracted by the small things, which are of course important in their own way, when the really big stuff is going on that's totally eclipses. So it's been really great to see, I think onshore wind is now legal again in the UK. We've not had any onshore wind, as far as I understand, since the Conservatives were in power, it was banned. Uh, and then also um, the banning of the North Sea oil, new North Sea oil contracts, two fantastic bits of policy that have already happened. So that's, that's extremely promising, but I hope they can go much, much further than that. And I think there's a lot of economic evidence now to suggest that you will massively improve the state of life for everyone in the UK by having huge government investment rather than trying to sort of throttle the economy further. Love it. Okay, so the future of polar on them. Where, what's what's around the corner? What we what can we expect over the next few years? Where would you like it to be? What? Yeah, sure. So we we raised some pre-seed money earlier in the year, and that's given us enough to employ some people and get some offices. And we're in the process of setting up some pilot studies. So that means we're going to pair up with a, a, a short list of companies from key industries that we want to work with, and really focus on getting our tool, our AI models, to work for exactly their needs. And then once we've got that, we'll probably have to raise some more money, as is normal in this space, and take the tool to the next level. And then we'll really start in earnest saying, right, you know, let's find our customers, let's make a big impact, let's try and reduce the uh, you know, carbon footprint of all these different industries by optimizing their design processes and getting better products to consumers. That's, that's what we're going to do in the next few years, and it's very exciting. Yeah, really good. And if people want to find out more about you and Polaron, and where would you like to take them? Where, where's the best thing, place to find uh, them? Polaron.ai is our website. You can go there, but I should be relatively easy to find just by having a very mundane name. Samuel Cooper at Imperial, you'll be able to find out everything about our research group and all the things that we do. And you're very welcome to get in touch. I get contacted by the public on a relatively regular basis, sometimes asking really charming questions about, you know, they've come up with an idea about how to get energy from trucks wobbling from side to side. And obviously I can't reply to all of them, but occasionally you think it's interesting why that won't work. I can explain it, but it's going to take a few minutes. And it's actually quite a pleasant part of the job um, to have people reaching out to try and understand what's going on in the world. I think it's really lovely. And it's kind of a responsibility of the job as well to teach undergraduates, but also share what you're doing with the public to some degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll put all of that in the show notes. Uh, we'll put it in the comments. But I, I just love your energy, Sam. I love your optimism. You. I think we need more people like you bringing optimism and, and energy to this space. And I'm super excited to see where this goes and really you know, good luck to Great. the future. Thank you very much. I appreciate Cheers. it. Thank you for tuning in to the Energy Futures podcast. Here at Energy Futures Lab, we are dedicated to addressing global energy challenges through pioneering research, innovation, and advocacy. To learn more about us and the exciting projects we are working on, visit our website and follow us on social media. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and share and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest content. Until next time, stay curious.